Military gliders gained immortality in several high-profile operations in World War II, from the German assault on Eben Amiel Fortress in Belgium in 1940, to D-Day, an Operation Market Garden in 1944, and the crossing of the River Rhine in 1945. They carried special landing troops behind enemy lines, or transported cargo and vehicles. Unpowered and much cheaper than aircraft to produce, built mostly from non-strategic materials, the military glider was often reusable and able to carry very heavy loads large distances. They were only replaced in the 1950s by improved helicopters that took over all of their battlefield roles. In 1943, a hair-raising plan was conceived to use gliders in a revolutionary new way. Instead of transporting men and equipment relatively short distances from England to European battlefields, why not use them on huge distances to help bring supplies from North America to Britain? In other words, have gliders cross the Atlantic Ocean? The theory made sense. Towed by C-47 aircraft, each glider would form part of a two-ship air train joined to the C-47, both aircraft hauling supplies and personnel in stages to the UK for forward shipment within the country and elsewhere. The problem was no one had ever attempted such an ambitious flight before. Only conventionally powered aircraft making the dangerous long voyage from Canada to Scotland via Greenland and Iceland, a distance of some 3,500 miles, and many ordinary aircraft were lost in such transport flights, falling prey to mechanical failure, horrendous weather, severe air turbulence, enemy fighters, and even flying into mountains. If the glider bridge across the Atlantic was to become a reality, someone had to be the first to attempt it. Air Chief Marshal Sir Frederick Bowhill, commanding RAF Transport Command, volunteered his own son-in-law for the hazardous mission. Wing Commander Richard Dickey Says was less than impressed with the mission, but he was under official orders. Says was sent to the UK to learn how to fly gliders, his own background being an RAF night fighter pilot who had earned the Distinguished Flying Cross for gallantry. The type of glider to be used in the transatlantic mission was the CG-4 Waco, an American design called the Hadrian in British service, built by piano makers. Says christened his glider Voodoo. The Waco had a wingspan of nearly 84 feet, or 25.5 meters, and was connected to the towing aircraft by a 350 foot or 107 meter long nylon rope. It could carry mixed loads, for example 13 fully equipped troops, or one jeep and four men, or six stretcher casualties and 4,000 pounds of cargo, and was designed to fly no faster than 150 miles per hour. In spring 1943, Says and his co-pilot, Wing Commander Fowler Gobile, Royal Canadian Air Force, undertook some training missions in Canada. They flew, towed by a C-47, from Montreal to North Bay, Ontario and back. The second sortie took them to the US state of Maine. The third, more ambitious round trip was undertaken from Montreal to Goose Bay, Labrador, setting a new world record for longest glider journey. Next, Says and Gobail conquered over water flying, making a journey by stages from Montreal all the way to the Bahamas. The return journey, one non-stop stage, Nassau to Virginia in the US, established a new long-distance record of 1,187 miles in 8 hours 50 minutes. That's a third of the distance they would need to travel to reach the UK. On the 23rd of June 1943, the transatlantic flight commenced. The tow aircraft was fitted with extra fuel tanks to the point of actually being overloaded. Say's glider was also heavily loaded with vital cargo, 3,360 pounds of radio, engine and aircraft parts, plus blood plasma for the Soviet Union. Also accompanying the C-47 and Voodoo was a Catalina flying boat that was being sent to Britain. 
the Catalina, which could land on water, would shadow the tow plane and glider and theoretically rescue the crews if they had to ditch in the ocean. In reality, due to the mission's route over the sub-Arctic regions all the way to Scotland, it is unlikely that anyone would have survived a ditching or that the sea state would have been conducive for an open ocean landing. The first leg of the mammoth journey was from Montreal to Goose Bay, Labrador. It was very nearly the end of the mission and the end of the men. Four hours in, the planes ran into heavy turbulence. The stress on the tow cable was immense as the C-47 and the Hadrian glider were pitching and rolling, diving and bucking through the disturbed air. It snowed hard and ice began to form on the glider's wings. In all, the aircraft battled through three immense snowstorms before arriving over Goose Bay. The glider's tow cable was released and Says made a good landing. On the 27th of June, leg two of the mission began, Goose Bay to Bluey West 1 US Air Base in Greenland. It took five hours to make it, flying over solid cloud cover until the island's mountains appeared. Again, Says executed a textbook landing. Repairs were necessary to the tow rope, which was badly worn. For two days, the crews rested before the next test, leg three, Greenland to Iceland. On the 30th of June, the three aircraft took off, flying down an iceberg-filled fjord and then out over the open sea. The weather was very bad, rainstorms, thick cloud coverage and more severe turbulence. Fog was so bad that Says and Gobile often couldn't see the C-47 in front of them. Both aircraft began to ice up. It was so cold inside the glider that condensation actually turned to snow. Eventually, the weather cleared and mountainous Iceland appeared on the horizon. Escorted by three American fighters, the pilots realised that they were now in an active war zone. Landing safely, more tow rope damage required repairs. Leg 4 commenced on the 1st of July 1943, flying from Reykjavik in Iceland to Prestwick in Scotland. Fighting severe turbulence, the three aircraft made it to cruising altitude, but they were unescorted. As they approached the UK, RAF fighters failed to appear as required, and the crews of the unarmed aircraft remained on high alert for German aircraft as they crossed the sea, in sunshine, then in heavy rain, and then again in bright sunshine. As they crossed the Scottish coast, barrage balloons became a hazard, their steel cables designed to slice the wings of enemy raiders. The C-47 narrowly missed a collision with a balloon cable. After several hair-raising manoeuvres, the C-47 and the Voodoo arrived over Prestwick Airport in Scotland. The tow rope was released and Says made a perfect landing. He had just set a world record that stands to this day the only transatlantic glider flight in history. In the air for 28 hours and 3 minutes over 8 days, Voodoo had flown 3,500 miles. Unsurprisingly, a committee at the Air Ministry in London decided that creating a transatlantic glider supply service was simply not feasible. Says and his co-pilot, squadron leader Gobile, and the captain of the C-47, Flight Lieutenant William Longhurst, all received the Air Force Cross for this daring mission. Voodoo was ordered to be saved for the nation and transported to a museum. Unfortunately, it was written off in a landing accident shortly afterwards and scrapped. Many thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share, and also visit my other YouTube channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, details in the description box below.